So you spent the day thinking about how this technology is exciting, and you're in the Ontario Public Service, and you've probably thought even more about the, uh, the hype and the uh, crazy opportunities that we might see with this technology. At the same time, you're in the Ontario Public Service, or a lot of you are, and there's this underlying fear that we see a lot of the time that, well, if the computer is intelligent, I thought that's what humans were supposed to do. What's left for us? Behind all of this is a lot of confusion. In particular, it's not entirely clear what we're talking about when we're talking about artificial intelligence. And if you read the press, for the most part, we're either talking about C-3PO or we're talking about Skynet from the Terminator, and the big debate that we seem to be having is which one's going to happen. Now, to be honest, I don't think that's a crazy debate, but it is not the technology that's gotten everybody excited over the last few years. The technology that makes us talking about, talk about prediction, te technology that makes us talk about AI in 2018 is prediction technology, okay? And so when you think about this excitement, think about prediction technology. Now, how did we get to this place? So Ajay, Joshua, and I are professors at the University of Toronto, you know, there, and I guess kind of here too. And um, as this audience likely knows, a lot of the innovative research underlying the current excitement a lot of the core machine learning research happened right here at the University of Toronto. All right, Jeff Hinton was here, and from the University of Toronto labs, the heads of AI at Apple, the head of AI at Facebook, the head of AI at OpenAI uh, arose. And so we started to see their students and grand students, I guess, in the Creative Destruction Lab. Starting in 2012, we started to see these companies calling themselves AI companies. And that seemed unusual and strange. We didn't know what this technology was. Back in 2012, this was new. When we thought about AI, you might have thought about the Jetsons or C-3PO. You might have thought about expert systems. But trying to get our heads around what was new and what was different here was important. And so that's you know, using those insights from the hundreds of companies that we saw, the startups we saw through the Creative Destruction Lab, combined with our point of view as economists gave us a different perspective. Now, we, we honed that perspective in the previous generation of technology. So looking around the room, it looks like about a quarter of you remember 1995, maybe a half, OK? Um, so if you don't remember 1995, here's some exciting things that happened. Um, the internet was fully privatized that year, so it was no longer part of the NSF. Uh, Netscape which is a precursor to Safari, um, had its first, had its IPO, and it was valued at over a billion dollars with zero profit. Now we're relatively used to that kind of thing, but this was the first time something like that had happened, where this company that was fully valued based on promise had an IPO and was valued in nine figures. So, um, and Bill Gates had his internet tidal wave email. Now, there was all this excitement around this technology. Everybody was saying, wow, this is totally different. This is totally new. Netscape, this value makes total sense. The economists, this isn't, the old economy doesn't apply anymore. This is a fundamentally new economy. And of course, there was one group of people who said, no, 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 it's not a new economy. It's the same old economy. Some stuff has changed. That group of people was us. It was the economists. What did we say? We said, well, the cost of search has fallen. The cost of communication has fallen and the cost of copying is fallen. Once you understand those three things, everything else follows, okay? Copying's easy, worry about privacy, and worry about piracy, okay? Search is easy, well, we're now gonna have more price competition, and the, the companies that can uh, get you the thing you want in the most efficient way are gonna be the ones that win. So by simply understanding what costs fell, we can understand the consequences. Let's jump back at technology. This is a semiconductor. What does a semiconductor do? You can again think about it as a drop in the cost of something. Indeed, what does a computer really do? Computers only do one thing. Computers add. That's it. 
But it turns out, when arithmetic is cheap enough, there's all sorts of opportunities for arithmetic that we might not have dreamed of. So all computers do is add, but when the cost of something falls, economists know that quantity goes up. We do more of it. If you took an econ class, you know, at some point in your life, you remember the demand curve sloped downward. When prices fall, quantity goes up. That's all this point is. When the cost of arithmetic fell, we did more arithmetic. We found all sorts of new opportunities for arithmetic that we might not have dreamed of. What happened first? Well, we started using arithmetic for classic arithmetic problems. Computer arithmetic replaced human arithmetic. Uh, machine computers replaced human computers, as you might have seen in the movie Hidden Figures, right? So we had cannons. They shot cannonballs. It turns out it's a pretty challenging arithmetic problem to figure out where the cannonballs are going to land. We used to have teams of humans doing up, adding up those numbers. And then the first applications were having machines do it instead, machine computing. If you asked an accountant what they did in the 1940s and 50s, and maybe even the 60s, they spent time adding numbers. They literally added up columns of numbers. If you were a student studying accounting, you were given a phone book, and you were told to add up the columns in the phone book as practice, because that's what you would be doing for the rest of your life. But it turned out that wasn't quite true, because with machine computing, we, could, we no longer had to have the human doing the arithmetic. But it turned out as arithmetic got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, we found all sorts of new applications for arithmetic that we might not have dreamed of. It turns out that games are arithmetic problem, mail, music, pictures, all these things are arithmetic problems once arithmetic becomes cheap enough. Which gets us to the convolutional neural net. Technology that has driven much of the excitement in AI. What is this? It's a prediction machine. So you should think about what's changed in the last few years is a drop in the cost of prediction. And what does that mean? The same thing it meant for arithmetic. As prediction gets cheaper, you should expect that we're going to do more and more and more prediction. And it turns out prediction is a pretty important thing. And that's why this matters. So prediction is using data you have to fill in data you don't have. It's the process of filling in missing information. That's valuable because information is core to decision making. And so you need good prediction in order to make better decisions. So what happens with cheap prediction? Well, the first applications, just like with cheap arithmetic, have been classic prediction problems. Someone walks into a bank and they want a loan. The bank needs to predict where they're going to pay that loan back. It's an old-fashioned prediction problem. Are they going to default? And now we use machine learning, we use prediction machines to solve that problem. Insurance risk. Is somebody going to make a claim? That's an even older-fashioned prediction problem. And we're now using machine learning, we're using AI to make those predictions. But it turns out, as prediction has gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, we started to find all sorts of other opportunities for machine prediction that you might not have obviously thought of as prediction problems. A core thing that doctors do is prediction. That's what diagnosis is. It's taking data on symptoms and filling in the missing information of what's causing those symptoms. Image recognition and object classification, that's another prediction problem. How do I know that's a chair? Well, my my eyes, my retina is really taking signals of light, convert that information into uh, other information to fill in the missing label of chair and context of what that means. Autonomous driving is a particularly interesting prediction problem because the recent advances in autonomous driving have been the recognition that you don't actually need to figure out what the car should do in every situation. You just need to tell the car, predict what a good human driver does. And if the car knows to predict what a good human driver does, then it can um, drive well. Prediction can be predict what a human would do. And once you understand that context, you can see there's a whole bunch of other opportunities that we haven't yet thought of. We're only a few years in. Think about how far we've come in the 70 years since, uh, since the computer. We're only a few years into 
really understanding the commercial opportunities in AI and machine learning. So prediction's valuable because it's an input into decision making, and decision making is everywhere. You make big decisions. What job should I take? When should I retire? Who should I marry? You make smaller decisions. Should I scratch my nose? Should I write that down? Should I look in the other direction? These sorts of things, right? But it's important to remember that prediction is not decision making. And that's where the opportunities for, for humans in terms of what our jobs are going to be and for organizations in terms of what assets you have that are valuable come from. How do we understand that? So remember Econ 101 again. When the price of coffee falls, we buy more coffee. Right? That's demand curve slope downward. When the price of coffee falls, we buy less tea. That's substitution, which means that if machines are going to be doing prediction, humans aren't going to be doing so much prediction. But more importantly, in the core opportunities come from when the price of coffee falls, we buy more cream and sugar. And so the thing you need to be asking yourself are what are the cream and sugar for prediction? What, as the price of prediction falls, what becomes more valuable? And they are the other aspects of decision making, the parts of decision making that aren't prediction. The data that feeds the prediction, the actions that you can take once given the prediction, and the judgment to know which predictions to make and what to do once the numbers come back. Those three things are the core to successfully innovating and take advantage of a prediction machine. So, where does this all leave us? It's a question not so much of if predictions gonna, if machines are gonna do the predictions that you do, it's more a matter of when. And so we like to think about this as a little thought experiment. It's a retail sector thought experiment, but underlying it and underlying what you should be thinking about is think about prediction as a dial. Right now it's pretty low. Machine learning is it's fine. But in many cases, when you see what it is, it's not totally transformational. But that prediction dial is going to get higher and higher and higher and higher. And you need to think through, when is it going to come to a point where it changes how you operate? So here's Amazon's recommendations for me. A few, few months ago, uh, they know that I like AI, and they know that at least, let's say, my children like video games. And so if you look at those, they're pretty good. They're right, I don't know, maybe one out of 20 times, they recommend something, I buy it. It's not bad, but it's not transformational. And Amazon's business model is the same as the Sears catalog's business model over 100 years ago. They show me stuff, I pick it, I shop, they send it to their warehouses, and their warehouses mail it to me. Sears catalog, it's kind of the same thing, right? Not so different. Prediction doesn't seem to be fundamental here. Now let's turn up that dial on prediction, and you might even turn it up all the way to 11 if you want to. What happens now, they don't need to wait for me to shop. Amazon knows what you want before you go to the website and buy it. Their predictions are so good that they anticipate what you're going to want, and they're almost always right. They don't have to be always right, but at that point, they can ship it to you, and you just shop at your door. They ship it to you, and if you don't like it, they have an infrastructure for sending back returns. So think through, as that dial on prediction gets better, there's all these new opportunities to restructure the way organizations operate. And just in case you think that sounds like science fiction, they do have the patent, and they filed for it three years ago. Okay. So a lot of us, I think, experience a little bit of dissonance. When you see the AI in operation today, it seems it's cool, it's neat, but it doesn't seem fundamentally transformational. Amazon's recommendations, they're good. Yeah, they have millions of products, and they can kind of guess what I want. Uh, when Gmail predicts how I'm going to respond, if my response is going to be thanks, they do a pretty good job. If it's going to be something else, they don't, because they always recommend thanks. Um, when they, being the gremlins in the machine, um, you know, Siri's fine, but uh, this is, it's not perfect. There's a lot of things that go wrong. And yet, when you hear what people are talking about, VC investment in AI is going through the roof. Google has moved from mobile first to AI first, meaning they will sacrifice the customer experience in order to improve their AI, in order to learn. And they've moved their AI people right next to the CEO's office. Government of China has said they're going to be number one in AI by 2030. 
investing billions and billions and billions and billions. And of course, Vladimir Putin has said whatever, whoever controls AI is going to control the world. How do we make sense of this? It's a question of your thesis about how fast that, di that dial is going to turn. If it's 10 years, you can wait and see what happens. If it's three, four years, well, if you act now, you'll be able to figure out what to do and your organization will be in good shape and your jobs will be in good shape. If it's six months to a year from now, then uh, start reskilling quickly. So those ideas are all part of the book. It's Prediction Machines. Uh, it comes out in April. Thank you.